Welcome back. So in today's agenda, we're going to go over the angular velocity discussion immediately followed by the derivation of the so-called transport theorem. And this is going to be followed by the derivation of the kinematics differential equations, or in other words, equations that will allow us to calculate the rate of change of any attitude representations we can think of, whether it is the rotation matrix, earlier angles, axis angle, and or quaternions, okay? So we're gonna derive the time derivative of the quaternion, the time derivative of the earlier angles, the time derivative of a rotation matrix, such that ultimately this piece of information, which is all about kinematics, will be very helpful whenever we get to simulate in MATLAB Simulink, a rotational motion of a rigid body or rotational motion of a spacecraft. Because ultimately we're going to have a box in our Simulink diagram called Dynamics. This one is going to take as input the external torque applied to the spacecraft expressed in the body fixed reference frame, tau b. Is going to do some calculations based on the dynamics equations of motion of a rotational, of a rigid body undergoing a rotational motion. And then at the output, we are going to get the angular acceleration of our spacecraft, omega b dot, which we will then integrate 1 over s to get the angular velocity components in the body fixed reference frame and based on this quantity differential kinematics relationships will allow us to calculate either the rate of change in our attitude matrix or rate of change of our roll pitch yaw angles or for example if you decide to use the quaternion uh, attitude representation then we're going to get the rate of change in our quaternion q dot and then all we have to do to obtain finally the actual orientation of our spacecraft would be to integrate those kinematics differential equations to get either our attitude matrix cbi our earlier angles rho pitch yaw or the quaternion q Okay, and then the actual attitude is going to be fed back to the kinematics equations. By the way, in practice, we're not going to calculate all of the attitude representations. It's going to be up to you as an engineer to select the most appropriate attitude representation, say the quaternion, and just forget about the other ones, right? Because there's no need to calculate all of them simultaneously. So you would calculate quaternion rate, q dot, integrate, and get quaternion as a function of time. Feed back your quaternion into the kinematics equations and close the loop like that. Okay? So, ultimately the goal for today is to derive those equations for a rotation matrix and all the other attitude representations. And then in the next lecture we're going to shift our focus to the dynamics rotational equation of motion. By the way, this equation will be known as Euler's equation of motion, which allow us to predict or calculate the angular acceleration in the body fixed reference frame, given some external torques being applied to the spacecraft. Okay? But that will be in the follow-up lecture. So today's is all about kinematics and to begin with we're going to have a look at angular velocity and the transport theorem and also review the derivative of the vector before we establish all the tools we need to jump into kinematical differential equations okay so in 1.4 we have angular velocity and transport 
theorem, which you saw in orbital mechanics. Okay? So we're going to break those two things in two different sub subsections. So first, angular velocity. Okay, so let's consider two reference frames, a fixed one or an inertial one, which is denoted by A, reference frame A, with its three unit vectors, AX, AY, both into the plane of the whiteboard, and AZ, perpendicular to the whiteboard, coming at you. That one doesn't move, but then let's define another reference frame. Let's call it B with three unit vectors, like that. And let's assume that this reference frame is in rotational motion with respect to reference frame A, which is inertially static, okay? If that is the case, then we're gonna say that reference frame B is going to have an angular velocity vector with respect to A, okay? So this is to be read as angular velocity vector of reference frame B with respect to reference frame A, omega B A. And that uh, angular velocity will be changing with time. It doesn't need to be fixed, okay? Such that this body, this rigid body quantified through the moving reference frame could be undergoing some a generic tumbling motion about all of its three axes simultaneously. So again, this angular velocity vector doesn't need to be fixed in space. It could be moving around. That is the angular velocity vector, omega b a, which is this with respect to this one. But as an observer, if you were to sit on reference frame b, and look at reference frame A, you would think that you are the static observer and that reference frame A is therefore moving with respect to you. So if we have an angular velocity vector of B with respect to A, we necessarily have also an angular velocity of reference frame A with respect to reference frame B. Turns out these two are exactly equal in magnitude, yet an opposite direction. So we're going to write omega AB is going to be equal to minus omega BA. Okay? And brought from an inertial perspective, if you sit back on reference frame A and you look at your moving reference frame B spinning in space, then you say, okay, those three unit vectors are changing with respect to time from my inertial perspective. And therefore, they must have a non-zero inertial time derivative. And this inertial time derivative operator is denoted by the over dot symbol, okay? Not to be confused with the hollow operator with deno which denotes a non-inertial time derivative or a time derivative seen from a point of view which would be a moving reference frame. Okay? So solid dot is always an inertial derivative seen from a Newtonian or an inertial reference frame. So those three quantities are obviously different than the null vector. Okay? And turns out that these because here we assume that the source of motion is omega BA, which is creating a spinning motion, is just going to be omega BA vector cross product with BX. And here for BY dot, it is going to be equal to omega BA cross product BY. And so, and similarly for BZ dot, so omega BA cross product with BZ direction. Okay, that kind of makes sense. 
let's then write that in terms of vectrices so that we could have an expression for the inertial time derivative of a vectrix in our back pocket that we could then use in future developments. So I'm going to write those three separate equations as simply the inertial time derivative of the transpose of vector B equal to angular velocity vector of B with respect to A and not the other way around, okay? Cross product vector B transpose like that, okay? So this is a very important result that we're going to use often throughout the uh, future developments in terms of deriving equations in this course. Okay, another thing I want to talk about in terms of angular velocity is the additivity property of angular velocity vectors. Meaning that if now you have not two but three reference frames involved, reference frame A, reference frame B, A is an inertially fixed reference frame and doesn't move, B moves with respect to A, and we also have another one, say reference frame C, which moves with respect to B, okay? So now we have omega BA, which is this motion with respect to uh, the inertial reference frame A, and we also have a motion of C with respect to B. Which means that if C moves with respect to B and that B moves with respect to A, then we can infer that reference frame C must be moving with respect to A. And that makes total sense, doesn't it? And to find out the angular velocity vector of this third reference frame C with respect to the inertial one, which is A, Knowing those two angular velocity vectors, we can simply write that omega CA is going to be equal to omega CB plus omega BA. And this is the additivity property of angular velocity vectors. And you can add them, there's no limit to that. Similarly to consecutive rotations with rotation matrices, you could stack them as many as you want by multiplying them and looking at the subscripts, where here it is a very similar property, but in terms of adding angular velocity vectors. And the trick is, again, to look at the subscripts. If you have C with respect to B and B with respect to A, this is the same as C with respect to A because it's as if the inner subscripts that are next to each other and equal, right, B and B, cancel out each other, so you are left with omega CA. And you could add five of them, okay? Just by making sure that the inner subscripts, the ones that are next to each other, uh, match, okay? So additivity property of angular velocity vectors, inertial derivative of a vectrix being equal to the angular velocity vector creating the motion, cross product of transpose of the vectors. Two very important results that we're going to use as we move forward, okay? But again, that was also a quick review of orbital mechanics. So there was nothing new here in that subsection. So next up, 1.4 was angular velocity and derivative of a vector. And now can move into the derivative of a vector part of it. So derivative of a vector. So now what we're going to do is consider some random vector in 3D space that we shall denote u vector. And as usual, we're going to define two reference frames in three dimensions, our good old friend, the inertial reference frame A, or in, in the context of the spacecraft attitude dynamics and control problem. Just keep in mind that that will be our inertial 
reference frame centered at the Earth, so that, that is the ECI, Earth-centered inertial reference frame, but for demonstration purposes, I'm always using A and B because I find it a bit easier. So A, X, A, Y, A, Z, as usual. And then we're going to define a moving reference frame in terms of rotation. That's our B reference frame, the X, Y, B, Z. And now what we're going to do is that we'll assume, again, that this one spins about omega B A angular velocity vector, and that that vector is free to move in 3D space, okay? Um, okay, so what we can do to begin the process of figuring out how to calculate the derivative of a vector, or in other words, how to obtain the transport theorem, or demonstrate the transport theorem, is that we're going to write vector u in terms of its components in the moving reference frame. So we just write, as usual, vector xb transpose times components of u in reference frame b. Now, if I were to take the inertial time derivative denoted by the solid dot symbol, all I have to do is to apply the chain rule, those two terms, and write that this is going to be vector xb transpose solid dot times ub plus transpose of vector xb and u b inertial derivative, like that. Okay, now we have to go back to orbital mechanics and remember what we had talked about back then, which was the non-inertial derivative of a vector, which was denoted by the hollow dot symbol. Yes, this is coming back to us. It's coming to haunt us back. Okay, now if you guys remember, this operator, the hollow dot, is only applicable to vectors and is there to indicate us in which reference frame do we want to take the components in. Because typically when you, take, when you think about any vectors, u for example, we are free to express this vector in terms of components in a moving reference frame or components in a static reference frame. Any reference frame is good for us. But when you see that specific notation, the hollow symbol, this is kind of red flag that says, hey, if you want to express that vector in terms of components, you better have to express them in the moving reference frame. You have no choice here. You couldn't express the components of that vector in the inertial reference frame because the hollow symbol is the non-inertial derivative and therefore the only choice we have is to express that vector in terms of its components in the moving reference frame, which happens to be B. And then components U in B. But because the hollow operator is not applicable to matrices, only to vectors here, all we do is that we take the normal inertial derivative of three scalars as they evolve with time. So the current X components X component of this vector minus the previous one over delta t would give you u b x dot and you do the same for y and z okay so this is something that hopefully rings a bell if not hopefully that quick discussion kind of made sense to you okay so again it's only think of it as an indicator in which reference frame that particular vector has to be expressed, okay? So this is inertial derivative. So derivative seen from this Newtonian reference frame A, as this is always the time derivative seen with respect to the moving one, okay? So if that's the case, then we can go back and look at what we have here. We have vectors B transpose times time derivative of the components of vector u in b, which turns out to be your u hollow dot. Okay, 
So now all we have to do is to rewrite that equation making use of this fact. So we're going to write u solid dot equal to u hollow dot plus time derivative of vectrix V transpose times u V components, or components of vector u seen in the moving reference frame. Are we stuck here? Or do we know how to move forward? Well, we know how to move forward because we just seen a couple of minutes ago how to calculate the inertial derivative of transpose of a vectrix. And that was the equation that said that that was equal to the angular velocity vector, or what is causing the motion, uh, of v with respect to a cross product with the transpose of the vectrix itself. Okay? And just applying the result we have derived previously to write this as omega ba cross product with vectrix b transpose. Okay? And all this multiplies components of vector u seen in the moving reference frame b. All right. Well, we know that this stays the same, omega b a vectors, cross product with. If you just look at those two terms next to each other, does that look familiar? Yes, no? Hopefully the answer is yes, because that is simply just vector u expressed in terms of its components and reference frame b. So vector u. And, oh, that was solid up here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the transport theorem rederived for you a second time because that was done in orbital mechanics. Okay? So that's your transport theorem. Yay! And this uh, transport theorem is applicable to any vectors in 3D space. Okay? So the inertial derivative of any vector will always be equal to the derivative of the same vector, but this time seen in a moving reference frame, plus what is causing the moving reference frame to move with respect to the non-moving one, cross product of the vector itself. Nice, 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 nice. However, this form could be useful, but us as engineers, we like to simulate things in MATLAB Simulink, and we like to play with numbers, and multiplying numbers together, right? And in other words, we like to play with x, y, z components of vectors. Not only some mathematical object called vector, but specifically looking at their x, y, z components, which can then be used to calculate things on your calculator, punching numbers, multipl multiplying them, adding them, subtracting them. So next, what we're going to do is to re-express this transport theorem but in terms of components, okay? So, this is the inertial derivative of vector u. Inertial meaning that this better be expressed in the inertial reference frame, which is A. And therefore, this vector u solid dot turns into this in terms of its components. Next up we have this guy. And you remember that the hollow operator gives you no choice as to which reference frame you want to express its components in. So it has to be the moving one, which is B. And therefore, it's going to be written like this. And never forget that the hollow operator, again, is only applicable to vectors, but not to three by one matrices containing components. That's just, it's not existing, okay? So we have to use the solid dot operator for the components here. Plus, what is this uh, vector? Sorry, <laughs> what is this vector in terms of its components? Well, you have the choice here. You could very well express that vector in terms of its components in reference frame B or reference frame A. 
a logical choice here would be to express it in reference frame B, such that here I had components in reference frame A. Here I already had components in reference frame B. So what I'm going to do is to keep writing those vectors in the same reference frame to be able to factor out the vectrix in the next step. Okay? So this, in terms of components in reference frame B, is going to be denoted like this, simply without the subscript B, because that would be kind of over overwhelming. Uh, and because I'm taking the vectrix out of those two vectors, I'm going to transfer that direct in terms of vector components operations, if you remember, right? A cross product of two vectors turns out to be the skew symmetrics of the components of the first vector times components of the second one. Orbital mechanics, chapter one. Okay? So now I'm in a good position to factor out my vector B out of everything on this side. Right? Only the components together plus omega B A Q symmetric times mu B. And that side stays the same for now. Okay? So again, the goal here is to rederive this transport theorem in terms of its components because that is the most practical application of this theorem, if you will. So the trick here is to take the dot product on both sides with vectrix A. Because if you come in like this and you take the dot product of vectrix A, and here, the same on this side, you call vectrix A dot product of the transpose of vectrix B, you should know that this gives you the identity matrix 3 by 3, an identity that multiplies the 3 by 1 column matrix will just give you the column matrix itself. So on the left hand side you get UA equal to this should look familiar because this is actually CAB when we looked at the first uh, use of rotation matrices and that is to relate the orientation of one reference frame to another. Somewhere in the process we had uh, express this rotation matrix as a dot product of A and B transpose. So I'm going to write C, A, B. That multiplies everything I have. U, B, dot plus omega B, A. It's Q symmetric times U, B. And I just kept forgetting my dot on the UA on that side. And that's it. So this is a transport theorem not in terms of vectors this time, but in terms of components. Okay? So this relates the derivative of a vector seen in the moving in the inertial reference frame with respect to the time derivative of a vector seen in the moving. Did I just say moving here? That was the non-moving obviously A, which is back to the time derivative of a vector seen in the moving reference frame. And also as a function of the vector itself seen in the moving reference frame and the cause of the motion which is omega B A or another cause of motion, but whatever causes the unit vectors of reference frame B to be uh, moving with time, okay? Good, good. So hopefully that was also reviewed from orbital mechanics, but because you took that course a couple of semesters ago, I assume, and that's a good refresher. The next section, though, 1.5 will be totally new. Yes, we like new stuff, don't we? Especially when it comes down to attitude dynamics and control. This is so much fun, hopefully.
Okay? It's found for me at least. So 1.5 is where we're going to dive into my kinematics block. If you remember the box team diagram I had. So first I had drawn a box with dynamics. I was kind of calculating the angular acceleration, which integrates to get the angular velocity. And based on the angular velocity coming in, there was this box called kinematics, that whose objective was to calculate the time derivative of the attitude representation you as an engineer had selected. Okay? So 1.5 kinematics. differential equations. So the first one we're going to have a look at is direction cosines or rotation matrices 1.5.1 in other words how to calculate the time derivative of a rotation matrix, which will then be in the process integrated to get the rotation matrix itself as a function of time. Okay, so to do the work, let's first write, uh, well, let's first assume we have a vector u that we're gonna, uh, hold on a second. Okay, well, the premise is the same as the past, so there's some random vector u there is the inertial reference frame denoted by A, and there is the moving one, just spinning around. That's your B reference frame. It's spinning about the angular velocity vector omega BA, okay? Nothing new here. So what we're gonna do first is to express the components of this vector in the inertial reference frame as function of the components of the same vector seen in the moving reference frame. And the relationship between this and that is just to apply the second use of rotation matrices, which was to convert the components of a vector from one reference frame to components of the same vector, but this time in another reference frame. So either you're going to use C, A, B, but you could very well we write that equation as C B A transpose times U B. Right? The C B A transpose is actually the same as the inverse of C B A, which turns to be C A B. Remember that? Okay. Now because uh let's do it with C A B, okay. So if you look at the first expression here, because this is essentially a bunch of cos of the different angles between the union vectors of A and the union vectors of B, and because B is in motion with respect to A, it means that those angles contained within that three by three direction cosine matrix are time varying. Or in other words, the time derivative of our matrix here is an equal to a bunch of zeros, okay? So therefore, if you were to take the initial time derivative of that expression on both sides, you then get a dot equal to, and then you need to apply the chain rule because this and that are both varying with time. So C, A, B, time derivative times U, B, plus C, A, B, times time derivative of u, like that, okay? But from the transport theorem in terms of components, we had just obtained the result of ua solid dot, which was uh, the rotation matrix first. Yeah. C, A, B, times u b dot plus omega b a skew symmetric times u b, right? We just did it together. Now what you can do here 
going to erase that top equation here, is to distribute the rotation matrix to both of those terms and write that QA dot here, but we also know, okay, that was obtained from the chain rule of this, and that was obtained from the transport theorem. It's not as if you go from this to this directly, okay, don't get confused. So here I'm just going to distribute the rotation matrix inside those curly brackets. And write that expression just like that. And all this is for u a dot again. Now look at what we have. And maybe I could even flip those two terms around to make it more obvious. C A B omega B A S Q times U B plus C A B U B dot. All this is for U A dot. Well, now we have two expressions for U A dot. But hopefully you'll agree with me that QA dot has to be equal to UA dot. Otherwise, we do have a fundamental problem here, okay? So I'm just going to write UA dot, obtained from the first expression, better be equal to UA dot, for which we obtain an alternate equation here, such that I'm going to write CAB dot times UB plus CAB u b dot, this is the first expression for u a dot, and then we said that has to be equal to that one, so c a b omega b a is q symmetric times u b, plus c a b times u b dot, who? That is a lot of CAB and UB, isn't it? Okay, so make sure you don't miss a dot in the process, which I often do on the board. Typically there are students in the classroom yelling at me and telling me, oh, sir, you forgot the dot, oh, thank you. But here I am on my own, in my basement, uh, with my homemade studio, the wonderful lightning, the wonderful microphone, and that nice camera. So I need to figure things out on my own whenever things go bad. So hopefully I didn't forget the dot somewhere or uh, a skew symmetric, okay? So if you look at that, you say, hmm, those two things look very similar. Because I have this term on the left-hand side, which is exactly the same as this, as this on the right-hand side. Which has to imply that this has no other choice but to be equal to this, right? Which means that C A B inertial derivative times U B has to be equal to C A B omega B A is Q times you be. But wait, what were we trying to accomplish here? What was our objective? Well, our objective was to obtain an expression for the time derivative of the attitude representation we had selected, which happened to be the rotation matrix. And look at what we have here. Because both UB terms cancel out, and we have now the time derivative of our rotation matrix equal to the rotation matrix itself times omega v a is cubed. Interesting. Because that happens to be the kinematical differential equation applied to rotation matrices. Or in other words, based on the angular velocity vector coming in, We have omega B A coming in, and that was coming from the integration process of the angular acceleration components 
which itself was coming from dynamics equations of motion, which we haven't seen yet for rotational motions. So dynamics, which itself was obviously based on external forces and torques, like this. So now here we've just solved the problem of the kinematics differential relationships because we have omega b a coming in that's given and we can calculate then at the output the time derivative of the rotation matrix c a b which will be able to integrate over time then calculate c a b as a function of time and actually the kinematics relationship here the rotation matrix is also a function not only of the angular velocity components, but also of the rotation matrix itself. So this term is being fed back in here, and the process goes on. And at the output here in MATLAB Simulink, you could generate nine graphs, all as function of time. And you'll be able to visualize the nine components of that rotation matrix as a function of time. Okay? That is the usefulness of deriving those kinematics differential equations. Okay, so that, that is a good expression that we can understand and put into practice in the numerical simulator like that. Uh, but oftentimes that relationship is not what we need because typically that works out for you know calculating the time derivative of CAB which is some generic rotation matrix here but in terms of spacecraft attitude dynamics and control problems what we'd like to do in this boxing diagram will be to get the time derivative of our attitude matrix that's going to be much more useful than some generic CAB. But here, if you were to do the mapping between body fixed reference frame and ECI to A and B, it would be the opposite, because this is the time derivative of the rotation matrix relating the fixed reference frame to the moving one. Whereas in practice, it is a lot more useful to get the, the time derivative of the rotation matrix relating the body fixed reference frame or the moving one with respect to the inertial one, ECI, or the non-moving one. So what we'd like to have in practice rather than CAB dot would be CBA dot. So how can we go from that expression to finding this? equal to whatever okay well to do that process what we need to do is take the transpose of that relationship on both sides okay so let me just apply the transpose operator on both sides cab dot transpose equal to and if you take the transpose of two matrices that are being multiplied together, if you remember linear algebra from first school, uh, first year of university probably, or even last year of high school, I'm not too sure. Uh, what it does is that you need to flip those two matrix around. So that would be omega B A skewed transpose times C A B transpose. Okay, so we take the transpose those two terms together, so you distribute the transpose operator to both, but you also have to switch the order of those two matrices. Okay, well, that, that is a lot to digest. But turns out that if you look at the definition of the skew symmetric matrix applied to any three by one column matrix, you will hopefully realize that the transpose of this 3 by 3 constructed out of this 3 by 1, omega b a, is actually the same as minus 
omega B A is Q symmetric. Okay? And the reason for that is because a skew symmetric matrix is symmetrical along the main diagonal, which is filled with a bunch of zeros, but with a negative one sign. Okay? And that's why this property holds here. So then you can come back here and rewrite that as minus omega B A skew times the transpose of C B A, as you know, is C. Transpose of CAB is CBA, right? And here the transpose of CAB dot is just simply CBA dot. Ha! Huh. That is much more useful than that expression, which was valid, right? There's nothing wrong with this. But in practice, you'd rather have this. Okay? So that is the kinematics differential equation applied to rotation matrices. In other words, how to get the time derivative of your attitude representation, which was the rotation matrix in that case. All right, so let's do a similar type of work, but this time applied to Euler angles. Or in other words, how can we calculate the rate of change of our roll pitch angles given as the input, the angular velocity vector or the components of that vector seen in the moving reference frame. So that would be in 1.5.2 earlier angles in terms of kinematics differential equations. Okay, so to, that, to do that we have to go back to what our earlier angles represent in this context. And if you remember, these were the three angles associated with the 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence. 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence with yaw, which is known by this pitch denoted by theta and rho denoted by phi respectively. And the way this is worded is fundamental because this is how you can map the angles to the principal rotations on top here. Okay? So when I say three two one with yaw pitch rho it means that this is through the yaw angle, that rotation is through the pitch angle, and that one is through the roll angle, and not vice versa, okay? Meaning that if you were to uh, write it in terms of what we did in past in the three-step procedure, we're going to go from, again, this is going from uh, reference frame A to reference frame B, A being the initial one, we're going to go through some intermediate reference frame denoted by A prime, and that is going to be through the rotation C3 with angle yaw. And then in the second step, we're going to rotate about the Y unit vector of F A prime to get us to A double prime in terms of intermediate result through C2 about an angle which is our pitch. And finally, we're going to go from the second intermediate reference frame, A double prime, to the final reference frame, B, via a C1 principal rotation through an angle of rho phi. Okay. And here, I'd like to emphasize the fact that although I'm going to do the full derivation as it is applicable to the 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence, if the sequence would be otherwise, you would have yourself to rederive everything, okay? Because that kinematics relationship is very specific to the rotation sequence. So pay close attention to the steps I'm doing. So to begin with, I'm just decoding what is given to me in terms of words, and I'm putting it in terms of mathematics. 3, 2, 1 sequence, 
three, two, one. Two angles, ya, yeah, pitch, roll. Ya, yeah, pitch, roll. Taking us from obviously the initial reference frame up to the final one via some intermediate reference frames. Okay? I didn't invent something here, I just read what was given to me. Now, that's how we had derived the full rotation matrix CBA uh, two lectures ago, probably. But here, instead of just looking from the static orientation point of view, or how to describe the orientation of V with respect to A at some given time, we're going to seek expression that relates B with respect to A, but in terms of motion. So now we need to uh, kind of visualize this intermediate reference frame and moving with respect to this one with some angular velocity vector and then this one moving with respect to that one with some other angular velocity vector and finally the last one moving with this second intermediate reference frame with another angular velocity vector okay so I'm going to put it in words here so that you can understand what's going on so I'm going to say that F A prime is rotating with respect to reference frame A with an angular velocity omega A prime A, so angular velocity of Angular velocity of A prime with respect to A. Okay. And I'm going to do, I'm going to write directly this in terms of that one. So the moving one. Okay. So I'm going to write it in terms of components with respect to the A prime reference frame. And the X, Y, Z components of this are related to the angle of rotation but the rate of change in that particular angle. So I'm going to write zero, zero, yaw rate. Okay? Because the relationship between that one and that one is only about, is a spinning motion about the z uh, unit vector and therefore the rotational motion is going to take place about the same axis which is the z vector and why i know that well because this is c3 and why do i know that this is c3 again i just went back to what was given to me and the first principal rotation was a c3 okay now here stepping down the line i'm going to say that reference frame a double prime is also rotating not only with respect to A, but with respect to A prime. So with respect to A prime, with omega A double prime, A prime, omega A double prime, A prime vector, that I'm going to express this time in the intermediate result here of this step, which happens to be a double prime, so vectrix A double prime. Uh, I've forgotten the transpose here. A transpose times x, y, z components of this angular velocity vector expressed in A double prime. So because the motion here is about the y unit vector, it means I'm going to get 0 x and 0 for z. And for y, it's going to be the pitch rate because the angle is pitch angle, such that its time derivative is going to be the time derivative of the pitch angle, referred to as the pitch rate. I'm going to do the exact same thing for the third step. I want to go a bit quicker and write that final reference frame, which is B, is also in rotational motion with respect to not only A, but also with respect to A prime, but furthermore, with respect to A double prime, which is kind of the sole focus of this third line here, the third step of the process. So B is rotating with respect to 
a double prime with omega b a double prime expressed this time in the final reference frame b and the components of this one hope we can see that somewhat clearly on the screen is going to be the roll rate because this motion here of just this single line is through the x unit vector of either reference frame because that is the axis of rotation so it has to be the same in both reference frames through an angle denoted by rho such that in terms of time derivative we're going to have rho rate zero zero this part of the process is the first step this is specific to the three two one rotation sequence as it is given to you now the second step up to uh, writing the components is generic because we'll always say that this intermediate is in motion with respect to the initial one then the second intermediate is going to be in motion with respect to the first intermediate and then lastly the last rotation matrix will be in motion with the second intermediate that part will never change what is going to change is what I wrote down here because this is specific to the rotation sequence because this was derived based on what I had written here in the first step and again this was solely based on what was given to me in terms of rotation sequence and their associated angles so don't ever just blindly copy this and an exam for say the 2 1 pre rotation sequence because that's going to make me mad and if I mark your copy of an exam you don't want me to be mad okay it's just not a good idea not that I'm a harsh marker well I can be harsh when I mark exams but I'm fair if I'm harsh for one copy I'm going to be harsh throughout the entire uh, copies okay so pay attention to what you're doing and make sure that you understand what I'm doing now in terms of teaching you the process. But that is a thought process. You need to think when you do that, okay? You cannot just blindly copy uh, that procedure and think that it's going to be right or applicable to any sequence. This is not how it works, okay? First step, decoding the sequence and the angles. Second step, figuring out the rate of change of the angles. The third step of the process is to use the additivity property of angular velocity vectors. So in the end, what we want is the time derivative of the angular velocity vector that relates moving reference frame B, or the final one with respect to the non-moving one, omega BA, okay? But this can also be written as a summation of other uh, angular velocity vectors as we saw previously. And specifically here, just by looking at the subscripts, I know that the first one shall begin with something like this. And that the last one has to finish with a name, right? Because what's going to go in the middle is going to be other angular velocity vectors. Uh, and I'm going to cancel out the subscripts that are next to each other and equal to each other. Remember the little trick I gave you of how to add individual angular velocity vectors together? Well, that's what I'm going to do here. So omega BA could be obtained from omega BA double prime plus omega a double prime a prime plus omega a prime a okay and just write it in a more cleaner, cleaner way omega the a double prime plus omega a double prime a prime plus omega a prime a Okay. Now what I want to do is to take that vectorial equation and turn that into components in the moving reference frame. 
That is kind of the fourth step of the procedure. Step one, step two, step three, and step four in terms of deriving the kinematical differential equations for Euler angles, okay? The trick again here is that the answer we're going to come up with on the board together today is very specific to the 3, 2, 1 sequence, and I can't say that and repeat that enough. You need to understand that, okay? So in the fourth step, I'm going to turn that into components and uh, moving reference frame, like this. This here is already, well, those two are already expressed in the moving reference frame, B, uh, because of the subscript, okay? So they don't need to use any rotation matrix because the components of this vector in either B or A is exactly the same, so it doesn't matter, okay? So I'm going to choose to write it in B, but that's what it is. That one could be expressed in B or A double prime as it is, but I'm going to choose to write it in B. Okay, so this is in reference frame B. This is also in reference frame B. Now that one as it is could be expressed in A double prime or A prime, but because I want it in B, it means that I need to use a rotation matrix here. And specifically the rotation matrix C, B, A double prime, such that this on its own is going to be expressed in A double prime. All right, this is A double prime. And therefore, I can make use of this rotation matrix here. And lastly, that one on its own can be expressed in A prime or A without involving any rotation matrices, but because I want this whole thing to be in B at the end of the day, I need to use C, B, A prime and express this one in A prime. Does this term in A prime. Okay? Turns out that C B A prime can be obtained as a combination of two principal or two rotation matrices. So I'm going to just rewrite this whole equation as omega B A components in B, omega B A double prime in B, plus C B A double prime, omega A double prime, A prime, A double prime, such that all together uh, we're going we're gonna to get components in body fixed reference frame or in the B reference frame, the moving one. But this one could be decomposed as C, B, A double prime, C, A double prime, A prime, right? And then times omega A prime A. So all I did here was to express this in terms of two rotation matrices because although that was kind of unknown up to this point, we couldn't derive that directly. We very well know how to express the rotation uh, or the relationship in terms of orientation between A double prime and A prime and also the relationship between B and A double prime. How? Well, just by going back to step one of the process and looking at those relationships, okay? A, omega B A double prime plus, if you look at what we had for the 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence, the last one was our C1 through an angle rho. So C B A double prime is C1 according to the, uh, the sequence given to me. C B A double prime is going to be the same thing here. So that's your C1 to an angle rho. C A double prime A prime was in the second step of the process and that was a C2. Yeah, C2 to an angle pitch. And finally, omega A prime A. 
Good, I'm almost done. Because next is only a matter of re-expressing the angular velocity components I have on the right-hand side of that equation. How? Through the second step of the process. Remember, I had written words like uh, B is in motion with A double prime and rotates with an angular velocity vector equal to this vector expressed in terms of components equal to, and I had given you those were the zero, zero, yaw rate, uh, zero, pitch rate, zero, and roll rate, zero, zero, at the very end of the board in this area in step number two. I'm just going to use those back into that equation and write that this is your roll rate, zero, zero, plus C1 through an angle uh, C1 through an angle rho. And if you look at what we had for the motion between A double prime and A, that was a pitch rate, so zero, pitch rate zero, plus C1 again, times this time C2, through pitch angle, and omega A prime A was the very first rotation of the process, so that was the three, so that was a yaw rate, zero, zero, yaw rate. And now I have everything I need to figure out the components of the angular velocity vector and the rate of change of my Euler angles as a function of the Euler angles themselves. Okay? And I'll be in step five of the process where it's only a matter of using a linear algebra and multiplying this three by three principal rotation for which I gave you the definition in the previous lecture, times this three by one, plus the definition of Cx or C1, times the definition of Cy or C2, just use the appropriate angles here, and not the generic theta x, theta y, theta z we had used back then, okay? Now we have specific Euler angles to play with, so use them in the definition of the principal rotations, times this guy here, which is the yaw rate, and add the three, three by one that you're going to get all of the multiplication process. And then you'll be able to rewrite this in terms of three by three times a three by one that contains roll rate, pitch rate, and yaw rate. And here will be a bunch of trig functions that depends on the Euler angles themselves. So here we're gonna get one, zero, 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 minus sine of pitch angle, cos roll, sine roll, Cos pitch minus sine rho cos rho times cos pitch angle. So to go from here to here, there's kind of one, uh, one extra task to perform, and that is because if you just do the sheer linear algebraic calculation here, you'll end up with omega b a equal to a big 3 by one uh, matrix, but your job will be to look at this and say, okay, how could I re-express that by, uh, by factoring out what I need in terms of Euler angle rates, and then figuring out what needs to go into a three by three matrix, okay? So I'm gonna let you do the process to figure this out on your own, how to go from here to here, okay? So pretend that this is a homework for you to do, it won't be marked, but that would be a good sanity check for you to ensure that you know how to do the process for yourself. If you are ever given another rotation sequence in an exam and you have to do the entire process on your own, okay? Well, we said, oh boy, 
that's not exactly what I want. Because what I wanted was the relationship that would take me from omega BA, kinematics, differential equations, to Euler angles rate, rho pitch yaw time derivative. Yet, what you're giving us here is the inverse relationship. You are taking that as the input, do some calculations, and you're getting that as the output. Well, not a problem, so all you have to do is to take the inverse of its matrix and then write the inverse relationship, right? Through linear algebra. Now, fear not, in an exam I'll never ask you to solve for the inverse of a three by three uh, matrix by hand. I mean, it can be done, it's just not fun and could be time consuming and under stress, I'm pretty sure that some of you would go wrong in the process. But essentially, all you have to do to go from here to here is take the transpose of that, such that you obtain at the end of the day the right relationship between omega BA as the input times something that would allow you to calculate the earlier angle rates, rho pitch uh, rate, okay? And taking the inverse of this filled with a bunch of trig function again is not trivial, but I'm going to give you the answer. 1, 0, 0, sine rho tan pitch, cos rho sine rho 1 over sine, so second of pitch. Just make this one a bit larger. Let me erase what I had here. Cos roll and pitch minus sine roll, cos roll, and 1 over sine or second of pitch angle like this. And this is actually the kinematical differential equation as it pertains to Euler angle. So in other words, these are the uh, time derivative relationships that allow you to calculate the rate of change in your attitude representation. In that case, Euler angles as function of the angular velocity coming in, which is the output of dynamics, essentially, and the current orientation of the spacecraft in terms of rho, pitch, yaw, angle. Although this is not a function of yaw angle, but generally speaking, it could, this matrix could include the yaw angle for another rotation sequence, okay? So again, if you're able to do the process up to this point on your own for another rotation sequence and end up with the right answer, you're in good shape for the exam, okay? So first, I would uh, encourage you to redo the process for the 3 two, one sequence and confirm that you do indeed get the same answer and then maybe try one or two other sequences and compare with a body or a friend of yours uh, such that you can work together and, and figure out uh, where your friend went wrong or where you went wrong, maybe. Uh, okay? And as always, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the process here or anything about the course, either by emails or through the live Q&A sessions. Okay. So that concludes the differential kinematics for earlier angles. Now let's have a look at differential kinematics, but this time for quaternions. Or in other words, how can we calculate the rate of change in our quaternions given the angular velocity coming in and the current quaternion that are being fed back, okay? So that would be in 1.5.3. Okay, here I'm just going to give you the answer to the differential equations for quaternions because... Uh, demonstrating that would be time time consuming and not that important. So here, well, quaternions. If you remember, quaternion has a vector part and a scalar part. 
turns out that the time derivative of the vector part is equal to one half eta identity three by three plus eta skew symmetric matrix times omega ba. So that works out, right? So based on omega ba coming in uh, to kinematics and based on the current quaternion, we are able to calculate the rate of change of our quaternion. And here is just the formula for the vector part, but we have another formula for the scalar part. And that one is going to be equal to minus one half eta transpose times omega ba. Okay? Or if you want, you could, you know, combine these two equations together in more compact form and just write that q dot is going to be equal to one over half eta identity matrix three by three plus eta three by one to choose the metric. And here minus one half eta transpose. That would give you indeed a uh, eta is three by one, three three by three, so that would be a four by three times your three by one, and then that makes sense because you're gonna get a four by one for Q dot at the end of the day. So in terms of blasting diagram, as always, you have omega BA coming in, and dynamics, kinematics, calculating you Q dot based on that equation, and then you plug in the integrator block to calculate the actual quaternion, and you'll be able to plot the four components of the quaternion as function of time. But you don't forget that kinematics always depend on the current orientation, so in that case, the current quaternion, which has to be fed back. Okay? So hopefully you learned something new today, and I think we did through the derivation of the... Uh, kinematical differential equations that will allow us to practically derive or calculate the rate of change of our attitude representation. And ultimately, again, as I said multiple times today, we'll be able to combine that with dynamics, which comes ahead of this, and to then implement a full simulator for the rotational motion of a spacecraft based on dynamics and kinematics, okay? So we're gonna save the dynamic uh, part for next time. Until then, keep up the good work. Uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.